In this video, I am finally reviewing the Uncanny X-Men Omnibus Volume 1. What's up guys, BJ Kicks here. I buy comics, I read them, and I review them, all for your viewing pleasure. If you're new here, welcome. If not, welcome back. Uh, on this channel, I talk about comics. I do unboxings, reviews, hauls, creator interviews, and really everything in between. So if you're interested in that type of content, consider subscribing to the channel. In this video, I'm giving you a review and an overview of the Uncanny X-Men Omnibus Volume 1. Uh, now, if you've been watching me for a little while, then you know that last year I was like, all right, here are my goals. Here are my goals for the year 2022. And the first goal I had was I want to read all of Chris Claremont's X-Men run. That whole 1975 to like 1991, I want to read that all in one year. And thankfully, Marvel has been reprinting these omnibus, uh, omnibuses, omnibuy, omnibu, whatever. They've been reprinting them so you can own them pretty easily um, in an oversized format that makes them easy to read and have all on one shelf or several shelves in my case. So I was like, look, I'm going to read one of these books every month this year. And by the time December comes, I will be all the way caught up. Then uh, it took me six months to read volume one. But hey, we're here now. We've read it. I've read it. And I got thoughts. Now, I'm gonna, what I'm, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to uh, give you like a top down view so you can look at the art. And I'll give you some of my thoughts as I'm looking through the art. Um, there are going to be some mild spoilers. I mean, these are like 40 year old stories at this point, but I do want to be you know, conscious of people who haven't read it before. And then I will give you my overall thoughts at the very end. So stick around. All right, guys, I figured the best way to give you my thoughts on this book would be to actually just show you the book. Uh, I could try to recap. That just wouldn't go well uh, altogether. So let's take a look at this book. I'll thumb through it. Of course, I'm going to try to keep this as spoiler free as possible. I mean, this is a 40 year old book um, and a lot of what you get in this book is kind of like teasers of what's to come. So I don't know if I could probably tell you every detail of this book and it won't be that much of a spoiler. But again, I want to be respectful. So I'm going to try to keep this spoiler free. And if I think there's something I'm like really giving away, I'll tell you when I get there. But we're looking at the Uncanny X-Men Omnibus Volume 1. This is the standard cover. Uh, the direct market cover um, is like an updated version of this image with the with updated colors. Uh, but this is the standard cover. Uh, you get the cover to Giant Size X-Men number one by Gil Kane um, and Dave Cockrum. So cool stuff. This is the first appearance of the new X-Men team. So prior to this coming out, the X-Men team was these original five, Jean Grey, Iceman, uh, oh, excuse me, Marvel Girl, Iceman, <laughs> Cyclops, Angel, and Beast. And here we get the debut of the new team, and it really takes X-Men to another level. Now, prior to this uh, coming out, the X-Men had been canceled. It had an ongoing series that went about 66 issues or so. They canceled it and started just doing reprints of X-Men all the way up until issue 90 or so. And then we got this, uh, starting with Giant Size X-Men. So what does this collect? This is, by the way, this is the printing from 2020. If you were to buy this book new now, you get a different looking spine. Uh, but this collects Giant Size X-Men number one, X-Men 94 through 131, and annual number three. Uh, cover price on this was $100. I got it. Um, back in the day from in stock trades, like I said, back in 2020, before I had even started this channel, actually. Uh, but anyway, so there we go. See everything it collects. Let's go ahead and jump inside. Whoops. So boom, Uncanny X-Men Omnibus. Very standard stuff. Um, this is technically Bronze Age material. Love these little marbled bookend pages. Love that. Um, and again, collecting X-Men 94 to 131, annual number three. Almost all of this is written by Chris Claremont, but you got artwork split by Dave Cockrum and John Byrne on those duties. 
we got this lovely image right here from X-Men number 100. Love that. We got our table of contents. Um, and oh, well, these are our credits, you know, table of contents. And then a foreword by Chris Claremont. And let me tell you, this dude, Chris Claremont, he writes. He writes a lot. He can be very verbose. He's a writer's writer, if you know what I'm saying. Anyway, you see how small this font is and still how many words are here? That's a foreword from 1990. And it says, it's always better in memory. This is actually a really good foreword. I, I encourage you to read it. But uh, yeah, we jump right in to Giant Size X-Men number one from 1975. This book changed it all for the X-Men. Uh, it's called Second Genesis. And again, this is where we get introduced to a brand new X-Men team. So we get the not necessarily always the first appearances, but this is the first appearance of Storm. I believe it's the first appearance of Colossus and Nightcrawler. And uh, there's Sunbird and Thunderbird, and I always get the two of them confused. Uh, but anyway, Wolverine had already made his debut in the pages of Incredible Hulk, but this is the first time he's getting like real heavy usage in any book, and he ends up on this team. So very cool stuff. And we, we jump off to a bang. Uh, now, it's important to note, Giant Size X-Men was not written by Chris Claremont. It's written by Len Wein. Um, and Len Wein basically introduces us to all these characters and tells us, gives us just enough background to understand why they're a part of the X-Men universe, and then basically hands the keys to Chris Claremont. And little does he know, Chris Claremont is going to keep those keys for like 26 years straight. That's crazy. But anyway, so we get introduced to Nightcrawler. We get, we see Wolverine here. We're also introduced to Storm. You know, they, I'll talk, I'll talk more about Storm later. But we're introduced to Storm, Colossus, and let's see, let's see if we can figure out what they're calling this man. Sunfire, Thunderbird, one of the two. <laughs> All right, so this guy is Sunfire, so the in, the Native American is Thunderbird. I thought so. But anyway, they all come together, and they're basically, they got to go on a mission to uh, save the original five X-Men. Uh, and I won't uh, spoil how or what they have to save them from, but suffice it to say, they finish the job, they save the X-Men, and then very shortly after, a lot of the original X-Men decide, you know what? We don't want to be X-Men anymore. We've done enough. You know what? Let's just hand the keys over to this new team. Um, and we go from there. Now, I got to tell you, my exposure to the X-Men before this was definitely just the animated series. I'd watched a lot of X-Men animated series, uh, and then the the 2000s movies franchise from Fox. That's that's where most of my X-Men knowledge comes from. So I'm biased toward Wolverine coming into these books. One thing I loved about this is it really focuses on Cyclops and how he handles his role as the leader of the X-Men. Very, very well done. Um, and that's something that we'll see with a lot of characters in this Claremont run is that he really, really does a great job of fleshing out their motivations, why they're doing the things they're doing, how each decision affects their mental state. Um, it's just a masterclass in character development. Um, now, one thing that made this a little bit tougher to get through, not tougher, but made me take more time, was definitely these letters pages. I was enamored with reading the letters pages after each issue. Like, I really, really loved reading those. But they take a lot of time. But it was really cool to see from a historical span standpoint how people reacted to all these new and exciting changes in the X-Men universe. Uh, here's Moira McTaggart. Uh, she's making what is among her first appearances, if I'm not mistaken. One thing I was curious about with Moira is as we're introduced to her, we're introduced to her as a sort of love interest for Charles Xavier. And later on in these pages, she's like someone else's love interest. And it's unclear to me 
how it got that way. I don't know if I skipped an issue. I don't know if I was just asleep at the wheel at that point. But somebody explain to me, how does Moira go from Professor X to Banshee? And how did no one bat an eye? Maybe they address it in later volumes, but I thought that was interesting. Uh, so here's a cool issue. This is issue 98. We've got the X-Men versus the Sentinels on Christmas. In this issue, we get a cameo appearance from Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, which is cool. And then we also, it's not just Stan and Jack, but we also get an appearance from Dave Cockerman and John Byrne, or excuse me, Chris Claremont and John Byrne. I don't know if that's this issue or in a different issue later on, but it definitely happened. So that was cool. Uh, but yeah, we get a lot of action. Now, at this point, we're still, we still got Dave Cockerham handling the majority of the artwork. But I'm trying to tell you that this really takes off a little bit later on when John Byrne gets on the title. So this is issue 99 here. We've got the X-Men in space. Are they going to get stuck there? What's going to happen to the X-Men? We don't know. Find out. But yeah, you can't really look at this book without really appreciating the artwork here. It's so hard for me to go page by page without spoiling it. But this part right here, this is the last page of issue 99. And so the X-Men are going into space and we got to figure out why. But in issue 100, look at this, a 25 cent issue. It's the X-Men versus the X-Men. We got the original five versus the new recruits and they're battling it out. And this was probably one of my favorite moments. This was my first like, ooh, I love this issue moment when I'm in this omnibus, issue 100. Besides Giant Size X-Men 1, of course. So the original five have to fight the new recruits and we figure out why soon enough. But also in issue 100, we get a very interesting development with Jean Grey because Jean has to basically sacrifice herself so that the X-Men can get out of space. And um, well, it happened. And in issue 101, spoiler alert, Jean Grey becomes the Phoenix. So this, I believe it's like 101 to like 107, they consider to be the original Phoenix saga, but Jean is being kind of reborn with these new powers. The extent of which do we find out in this book? I'll let you figure it out. Now here, here I want to make a point. I thought this was something just hilarious. Is that it seems like they just want Storm naked. Like there are so many references made to Storm like not wearing clothes. I don't know. I don't know if it's just like of the times. I don't know if there's like some weird fetish thing going on because Storm is like the only black woman on the team. But I just figured I had to note that. Throughout this volume, it's like they make it a point to give Storm the fewest clothes possible and also to give her all of the most random reasons to not wear them. But anyway, that's just a funny part. This is issue, is this 101 still or 102? But we get a nice origin story of Storm. And again, that's one of the hallmarks of this book is that it's just so great when it comes to character development, we get a lot of background. We learn a lot about how each person came to be an X-Man and, you know, some of their likes, their dislikes, some things that drive them. That was really cool. It's really cool seeing that. Um, and if you're in this title for the long haul, I think it definitely pays off as well. Now, one thing I will say is it can be a little slow because it's like you're getting these little bits of character development like drip by drip by drip like an iv throughout the like 35 issues that are collected in this book um here we got um, an appearance by magneto in issue 104 very cool we'll find out later why magneto's here to tussle with the x-men again um and again we're in space and i gotta say like the stuff that happens in space it's probably some of the least interesting, in my opinion. Like, it's not that it's not interesting. It's just not what I read the X-Men for. But what I love about it, though, is Claremont, like, understands, like, he's introducing so many things. Here's Lilian, or Lilandra Wheeler, 
who like inexplicably is one of Charles Xavier's love interests out of nowhere to me. Again, I don't know what happened with him and Moira. I don't know if they just did like a test group and was like, you know what? She should be with Banshee. But either way, Charles has a new love interest. And here's Phoenix. Um, and here we go to 106. Now, some things happen. And um, I don't know if I want to say this. But basically, at, there's a point where the X-Men believe that Jean Grey is dead. and there's also a point where Charles Xavier believes the X-Men are dead. And it informs a lot of what happens in the series. Um, I won't tell you why he thinks that or how he thinks that, or even if they resolve it, but it does inform a lot of the series. Um, and here we go, where no X-Men has gone before. This was the issue that was like, huh, for me, but this is the first appearance of the Star Jammers um, and a certain X-Men's father that I won't spoil here. And this is actually where I stopped reading the omnibus and picked up my iPad. But there we go. Let's move that bookmark out the way. Again, Alondra Wheeler and, and Charles Xavier, they've got like some weird thing going on. They both know that it's wrong, but it's much too strong to let go now. <laughs> I'm joking. But there we go. We got the Star Jammers here. So cool stuff. Like I said, all throughout this book, you're being introduced to new characters, new villains, new protagonists, um, and everybody's giving is given compelling reasons to be in the book. Like I said, somebody is someone else's father. Oh, and here we go. This is the first time Phoenix is like using her powers like to their fullest extent. And you're like, yo, what? What is happening right now? X Men 109. Here we are. So we're about halfway through this book at this point. And, you know, again, people, I, I can't go through the whole story because I'd be spoiling stuff. But this issue gives us an appearance from uh, the Alpha Flight. And I got to lie. I, I can't lie. I wasn't super excited about the Alpha Flight crossovers. I was just like, OK, I'm already having trouble dealing with like these alien species. And now introducing a whole nother superhero team from Canada. Am I ever going to care about them again besides this issue? So that was a thing. But what I love about Chris Claremont is like, it's almost like he knows. He knows when you need a break. So we had all this cosmic stuff going on, We're introducing all these people, Alpha Flight, Star Jammers. I'm like, yo, what is happening? Because nothing's getting resolved. We're just getting a whole lot of introduction. And then, boom, what do we get? A nice, simple game of baseball. Gotta love it. <laughs> and then, you know, somebody shooting Moira. Yo, there's another thing, right? I was only reading X-Men starting in like 2019 with Jonathan Hickman stuff. And there's a lot that we see unfold in here that Jonathan Hickman directly uh, pulls from and repurposes. And I thought that was really interesting, specifically a lot of stuff with Moira. Uh, so here we go. Here's another episode or issue. And I believe the guy, the villain in this issue, it's not Arcade. What's the dude's name? Oh, but by the way, with issue 108 is when John Byrne starts his run. And you can see the differences in the artwork already. Like, this artwork is dope. Once again, Storm is always going to be like the least clothed person on the screen at all times. I don't know why that is, but it is what it is. Look at Beast. I think Beast looks especially good here. And look at this. Look at Wolverine. Like, again, when John Byrne takes over on artwork, it's like, all right, I'm loving this book again. I really am. So that's dope. Um, but the X-Men are like trapped in a circus somehow. And boom, Magneto's back. What? Look, this splash page is dope. Like this. I, I can dissect this art all day. I don't want this book, this review to be more than like 20 minutes long. So let's hurry it up. Um, but yeah. More appearances from the Phoenix. She's really uh she's really doing her thing in this book. Holocaust at the heart of a volcano and falls Magneto. So Magneto like takes over a volcano and is like trying to kill the X-Men. Uh we'll find out if he's successful or not later on. Uh again, Storm Shining. Once again in this issue, Storm is a master pickpocket. Um and she's like, you know, big on breaking locks and all that. 
So she gets some shine in this issue. And boom. Jean Grey and Beast once again. But look. The Day the X-Men Die, issue 114. Beast carrying Jean again. All right. And here we are in the Savage Land. We got this X-Men, or Jean Grey and Beast. And then the rest of the X-Men are somewhere else. Cool stuff. Again, the Savage Land just seems to be an excuse to, like, draw all these X-Men without clothes. Again, Storm is always going to be the least clothed X-Men. See what I'm saying? Uh, but, yeah. Still on Savage Land. I liked these few issues that we got in Savage Land. Can't lie. Kazar the Savage, right? So that's cool stuff. It was a nice break from the action that we were getting. And like I said, I love that Chris Claremont makes every issue make sense in the context of the full story. Um, this is still being written in a time where there's no such thing as a trade paperback. So you got to be a little bit redundant in your storytelling. You got to kind of recap issues past in every issue, but it's worth it. It's worth it. So you get really good storytelling, in my opinion. Um, man, look at that. This art is amazing. Like if somebody drew something that looked like this today, I'd be like, yo, this is the best thing I read all week. Ahead of his time, man. John Byrne is just great. Uh, more Child Storm, Child Aurora there. We also got appearances um, from Colleen Wing and Misty Knight, so that was cool too. Oh, and here we go, we're in Japan. I know Omar loves that Japan link. X-Men with, sun, with Sunfire there. I can't just keep telling you what's happening at every point of the book because I feel like I'd be spoiling it and I told you I wasn't going to spoil it. But again, just look at this artwork. I love that every X-Man, every X-Man gets like a moment to shine throughout this series. It definitely feels like you're getting really, really slow teases and like the overall story isn't moving along that quickly. But every issue still feels consequential. Like Every issue feels important. Um, so I love that. Here we are. All right. So we're, we're back with the Alpha Flights. We got the Alpha Flight teased a little bit earlier. Now the full Alpha Flight are back. And like I said, probably the part of the book I was the least interested in. I was like, I don't, I don't care about Alpha Flight, but hey, it is what it is. Um, a good issue, a good issue. And if nothing else, the Alpha Flight appearance gives us more context as to why Wolverine is an X-Men. So that's cool. Again, I love these letters pages. One thing about reading this digitally, because I stopped, I started reading this digitally about halfway through. You don't get the letters pages when you read it digitally. So I encourage you, if you just love the full context, if you love like comics history and getting it from that perspective, Grab the Omnibus so you can get the letters pages along with it, too. I don't know if the Marvel Masterworks include letters pages, but I think they're more expensive than the Omnibus anyway. So there we go. Uh, Storm in the projects, helping some people out in Harlem. And we get an appearance from Luke Cage, of all people. Right? Cool stuff. And now we get to one of my favorite issues. This is issue 123. It's the Uncanny X-Men in Arcade's Murder World. Uh, oh, cameo, <clears throat> excuse me, and a cameo from Spider-Man, because I think Arcade was a Spider-Man villain first. But Arcade basically captures the X-Men, gets them trapped in like this game. They got to find their way out. They got to play their way out. It reminded me so much of one of the uh, episodes of the Batman the Animated Series with uh, the Riddler. I think it's If You're Smart, Why Aren't You Rich? Or one of the other. One, it's either that one or another one. But anyway. The Riddler traps Batman inside of a video game. This was very similar to that, in my opinion. And once again, John Byrne finding any reason to make sure clothes, uh, Storm doesn't have clothes on. So 
Here, she's swimming and it's like, oh no, my costume is weighing me down. I need to take it off so I can swim properly. <laughs> that is hilarious. I don't get why no other woman gets that treatment. It's just Storm throughout this book. So that's just a funny thing I'm going to keep pointing out as often as I see it. Uh, here's X-Men annual number three. I'm not going to hold you up. I skipped this annual because trying to get to it digitally was like, eh. So I did go back and look at it in the book to see, like, okay, am I missing a lot? And I felt like I wasn't missing a lot. So I haven't even read this angle yet. It's definitely good action, but it didn't seem like it was important to the overall story. Well, maybe. I mean, honestly, there's a lot that looks cool in here. Let me go back and read this annual. Uh, but we go right back to the action after the annual is over with X-Men number 125. Now, if you ask me, this issue right here is the start of the Dark Phoenix saga. Um, and it's so needed. It's so needed. Uh, so we get uh, sort of the dramatic return of Phoenix. We get a nice little recap of who Phoenix is, how she came to be. Look at the art once again. But yeah, so we get a sort of backstory as to who Phoenix is, how she came to be. Um, and then Phoenix is, uh, how should I say this? Should I say it at all? Let's just say Phoenix is having some issues distinguishing between reality and not reality. Um, and, you know, the present day and time way back in the day. So we get the first seeds of how the Dark Phoenix saga is going to go. And then we jump back into some other action with the X-Men. That's how it goes, right? You get like a really important feeling moment. And then they kind of just abandon it for the next issue and pick up on it later. Uh, so that's probably the most frustrating part about this, but but we get still we get some follow up on the Dark Phoenix stuff. I won't I won't spoil how, but then we also get the first appearance of Proteus, and that's what um, this issue is, right? I think he actually appeared in the, in one twenty six, but we learn who Proteus is, and his power is basically like to absorb people. And when he absorbs somebody, they cease to exist. Like, And so he's on a rampage and he gets stronger and stronger the more people he absorbs. So the X-Men got to figure out how in the world they can uh, stop Proteus. And there is a reason that Proteus is such a good X-Men villain. I won't spoil it, though. But Proteus can like warp reality as well. So it's, it's very interesting. Um, fun fact. Proteus is in the new X-Men 92 series right now as one of the five. And I thought that was really cool. But anyway, um, Proteus has a connection with someone else we know from the X-Men world. And I won't spoil it. I'll let you read it. And here we go. Issue 129, God Spare the Child. If I'm not mistaken, this is the issue where we are introduced to two new X-Men, one of which being Emma Frost. She's not an X-Men. She's a character in the X-Men. So we get Emma Frost and we get Kate, Catherine, Kitty Pryde. Uh, love that. So we get that first appearance of Kitty Pryde, a.k.a. Shadowcat. They're trying to recruit her onto the X-Men. And are they successful? Are they not? We'll find out later. Then we're also introduced to Dazzler in the very next issue. Um, does she decide to join the X-Men? I don't know. We'll find out later. Look, it's Sebastian Shaw. We're, we're finding out who the Hellfire Club is. Once again, Storm stripping off her clothes for some reason. What is it now this time? Oh, they took her lock picks, but they missed the tag worked into the fabric of her costume. So as long as she rips her costume, she'll be able to get them, get them out of this situation. And then, uh, yeah, so we got some Hellfire stuff that I'll skip out on. We got Dazzler, Prisoners of the White Queen. By issue 131, we are like deep, deep into what will be <laughs> your storm again. What what's happening, Storm? But yeah. By issue like 131, everybody is like, hey yo, what's happening with, with Phoenix? I feel like Phoenix is uh just a little off. Like something's going on here. What's the deal? And uh, that's the end of this omnibus. 
So as far as extras, we got a bunch of extras in the back, sketches, character designs, uh, all that good stuff. I loved it. The short version of this is I love this book. It definitely dragged at points, but I loved it. Um, but let me fix the camera view and I'll give you my overall thoughts. Man, I can't even lie. That was kind of difficult to like go through that without spoiling every little detail because I was so excited about the book. Um, overall, my thoughts are kind of the same, right? Like this book was a little bit difficult to read at times because I'm so used to modern comic storytelling with like 50 words, you know, in a whole book and all that, right? I don't want to say like I'm reading on a second grade level or anything, but again, like I'm, I'm used to a certain type of storytelling. So I felt like reading The Uncanny X-Men required like my full and undivided attention. And, you know, being a father of two, one of which being a newborn, that's not always the easiest thing to do. So this book, like I said, I thought I was going to be able to get through this in a month. And it took me like six months off and on. I pick it up, put it down, pick it up, put it down. But about two thirds of the way through, I'd say, this became like must read entertainment. It was very hard to put down. I'd find myself on my iPad reading like four issues at a time and like not wanting to go to sleep because I wanted to read more. But even still, even as exciting as it was, it still took a lot more time to read because Claremont, that Claremont, that Claremont, he is, he really likes to like explore the boundaries. How many words can we put on this book before it's no longer a comic? Like, it's crazy. But the stuff that we get, the character development, the moments between uh, Professor X and Moira, and then Professor X and Lodra, uh, we got Banshee and Moira, we get Nightcrawler and his, uh, you know, his kind of dealings with society. We get Colossus. Does he want to be an X-Men? Does he not? Wolverine. What's driving Wolverine? Uh, there are a lot of character moments. Storm. Storm is like so compassionate, so gentle, uh, but she's got this whole background as like a thief and all this. Like there's a lot, there's a lot to this book. There's a lot to these characters. And Chris Claremont is like slowly, slowly juicing it. It's almost like wringing out a towel after you like get it out of a swimming pool. It's like, it's gonna take some work. He's like slowly squeezing and slowly squeezing to see what we're gonna get out of this and you know, how much we're gonna love it and, and what's gonna stick and what's not. So I think this book does kind of suffer some from today's standards. But then when I remember this book was only coming out once every two months for most of the time that you're seeing it published in this omnibus, then it's like, okay, but by the time we get to the Dark Phoenix stuff or the teases of the Dark Phoenix stuff, I'm like, all right, I'm all in. I'm all in. And by the time we finished issue 131 on this book, I was like, yo, where's volume two? I need volume two. I need to read this right now. So I know <laughs> for those of you who are die X-Men diehards, they just did like a Phoenix Omnibus volume one. They just released that. You can grab it at Organic Price Books. I'll leave a link below. And uh, a lot of people were like, well, why is that being collected if we already got volume one and volume two, which complete that whole saga? Because, man, it was teased so much in these original series. So cut out the filler. Give me just the Dark Phoenix stuff. I can see why people would love that. But overall, my thoughts on this book, I give it a solid eight and a half out of ten. It's really, really good, but I just can't get past how wordy it is sometimes and how dense how dense it is. I found myself, all right, I'll, I'll read the captions, then I'll read the dialogue boxes, and then I'll admire the artwork. It's not till John Burns takes over and that I'm like, oh snap, this artwork is commanding my attention. Let me look at the art, then I'll read the story. So once John Byrne jumps in at issue 108 or so, I think it's just like, it's a marked improvement. And by the time we get to 131, it's must-see TV every issue. I gotta read. I gotta see what's happening with the X-Men. So expect my review of volume two way sooner than later. Um, and I'll see you in another one very soon. Until then, hope you saw something you liked in this video. If not, hey, that's cool. So you can always buy what you like. Just make sure you read what you buy and be nice to others because kindness makes the world go round. Peace.